Greetings, Victory Nation and those following us around the world. We're getting ready to start our hour of power. So before we begin, we're going to go ahead and start out in prayer. Father God, we just honor and we thank you right now, Lord God, for your goodness, for your word, for who you are, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, that you use Elder Yolanda Bogini, God, to bring forth your word on tribulation, peace, and victory. And we thank you and we honor you for sending your word and teaching us by your spirit on today. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, greetings and salutation, Victory Nation and all of our guests on this evening. Uh, we just thank and praise God for who he is and all the things that he continues to do in our lives. Um, we're going to go ahead and dive into this lesson on today. As uh, Elder Robert Vagany alluded to, we're talking about tribulation, peace, and victory. But before we even dive into these lessons, this lesson on this evening, you know, we'll do a recap, a brief recap of what we've been talking about for the past two weeks. On um, um, two weeks ago, Minister Kelvin Wilson talked about divine legacy of peace coming from St. John 14 and 27, basically talking about the peace of Christ and what the peace that Christ provides, what it gives to us as his believers. And on last week, uh, Minister Adrian Wilson, um, lesson 25, was talking about Christ in heaven, the church on earth, and it was talking about who Jesus Christ, who he was, and how he compared to, um, to God, and how he was coming to this world and the purpose for which he came and God sent him into this world, and also uh, that we should receive Christ and uh, for who he was. And we recognize that he was the son of God. He was the one that provided peace. He was the one that uh, died on the cross for our sins. And furthermore, when he ascended back up into heaven, he told the disciples that a comforter would come, which was the Holy Spirit. And that was in St. John chapter 16, verses 25 through 28. So if we just look at St. John chapter 16 in its entirety, um, starting from chapter one all the way to um, 29 through 33, which I will kind of talk about on this evening. In the first part of St. John chapter 16, it was talking about that the, Jesus was telling the disciples that they would endure persecution in verses one through four. And then verses five through 15, it talks about the spirit, why the spirit was here. Um, the Holy Spirit was here to help. It was is here to convict and is here to teach us as well. And then verses 16 through 28, it talks about the prediction of Christ's death and his resurrection. And then um, within this, Christ talking about his death and resurrection and telling the disciples about his death and resurrection, he was trying to let them know that it was, it, it was going to happen. It was inevitable that he would die, but he would be resurrected. And then the disciples kind of complained because they were like, you're talking in parables. We don't understand these parables. But in verses 29 through 30, they came, it's like they had the aha moment. They're like, oh, I understand what you've been telling us all this time, Jesus. And they responded saying, we understand. And then also on tonight, we're talking about, we're going to talk about after Jesus died and he was resurrected, many of his disciples went back to doing what they were doing previously. So in essence, they scattered. And on tonight, here is a scripture that I'll be focusing my energy on. St. John chapter 16, verses, verse 33. And I have it in four different versions, the Amplified, um, the American Standard, the King James Version, and a new, um, new NLT. Actually, yeah, new translation. New Living Translation, NLT. So it says in the Amplified, I have told you these things so that you, in me, you will have perfect peace. In the world, you have tribulation and distress and suffering, but be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished, my victory abiding. And that's the Amplified. And the American Standard Version, it reads, these things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And the King James Version, 
These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the New Living Translation, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. So in this, I talked about earlier that his disciples said unto him that they didn't want him to speak in any type of proverbs or parable and that they wanted him to speak plainly to them. Now, if we look at the, the scriptures here, I have four words that are underlined, peace, tribulation, um, cheer, overcome. And we're gonna try to decipher these words on tonight and give you some information, a new way of looking at this. Cause you know, many of you all have read the Bible. Many of you all consider yourself Bible scholars, but I'm gonna give you what God has given me on tonight. And um, in verse 31 of chapter 16, Jesus asked the question, do you believe? He was asked them, do they believe? And in 32, he said, behold, the hour come, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So Jesus understood what his responsibilities were. He came on this earth. He was born to, you know, Mary. His stepfather was Joseph. He came here during the last three years of his life. He ministered and he did exactly what the father had in store for him. But in essence, he wanted the disciples to know that he had provided them peace, even though you might have some tribulation in life that we need to be of good cheer because we've already overcome through Jesus Christ. So point one, we're gonna talk about tribulation. So for all of those who uh, like read in the Bible and study in the Bible. Um, I looked up the Strong's Concordance and the word, the Greek word, Greek 2347 for tribulations is the ellipsis. It means persecution, affliction, distress, pressure. And we look at pressure is something that basically constricts or rubs things together. Also, it means use of a narrow place to hem someone in. Tribulation uh, especially internal pressure that causes someone to feel confined, restricted, and without options. So the question on tonight, do you feel that you have, you've been restricted? Do you feel that you've been confined? Do you feel that you are stuck in between here and there? Do you feel that uh, there are so many distress and so many, so much pressures going on? You know, I think about over the past year, and a couple of months, you know, when coronavirus came on the scene, you know, everybody's focus has been on coronavirus, uh, coronavirus disease 2019. And we found ourselves in a predicament and not just we only, but we in general, the entire world, we found our, our, ourselves in a predicament and we felt that we've been afflicted. We felt that we've been stressed. We felt that uh, internally that we don't know what our options are. It seems like we're without options. But how many of you all recognize that when you have Jesus Christ, you have options? But when I was thinking about this, I was like, what types of things are we really contending with? Um, and I was talking about earlier that we feel like we're stuck in between. But what are we feeling that we're stuck in between of? You know, some people are feeling fatigued. Some people are feeling refreshed. Some people are feeling distracted. Some people are feeling focused. Some people have no expectations and some people have huge expectations. Some people feel disconnected. Others feel connected. Some people feel like they are, you know, always feeling tardy, but some people are always early and on time. Some people are feeling that there is major conflict. Some people feel harmonious. Some people are dealing with what's wrong and what's right. Some people are rest less and some people are restful. Some people feel um, the pinch with all the stuff that's going on. People have lost their jobs. Some people are feeling plentiful and some people are dealing with poverty. Some people are feeling like there's good versus evil with all the various things that are going on in society with um, the police and you know 
people of different colors, different races, so many things are going on, many trials are going on. Some people feel that we're in a dark place and some people feel like we're in a place of light. Some people are just stuck between here and there. Some people are stuck between now and then. So where are you? But how do you respond when you are contending with tribulation? How do you respond when you feel that you're confined and you're restricted? Elder Robert Bogany, thank you for that amazing question. I, I'm glad you asked me that question. So if you would look at Romans 8, verse 35, it says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? People are like, what do I do with all this? There's so much tribulation. There's so much stress. There's so much persecution. There's so much famine. There's so much nakedness. There's so much peril. And there, people are dying by the sores. There's wars and rumors. Or what do you do with those situations? Do you separate yourself from Christ? No, you do not separate yourself from Christ. Why? Because there's a purpose behind tribulation. And if you stay in the book of Romans and look at um, chapter five, verses three, it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. There is a purpose. People are like, patience? Don't talk to me about patience. I've been patient. I've been dealing with um dealing with coronavirus. I've been dealing with um, the results of coronavirus. I've been waiting for them to come up with some vaccination and then they've come up with some vaccination. And now you have Pfizer, you have Moderna, and now you have this Janssen, Johnson and Johnson. Now people are having all these complications. What shall I do? Once again, there's a reason for tribulation and it's work and patience. What is patience? Patience is endurance, steadfastness, you know, in the word in Isaiah 40 and 31, it says that if we wait upon the Lord, we, our strength shall be renewed. So even though we have tribulation, even though we feel like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, God wants us to know that it's not for not. It's because he is trying to work patience within us. And once again, like I said, patience means endurance and steadfastness. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, it says that we should be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we want everybody to know that your labor is not in vain. The situation that you're contending with is not in vain. We are going to endure. We're going to get through this. I promise you, we will get through this situation. But how will we get through this situation? Sticking in Romans 12, sticking in the book of Romans, we're going to go to Romans 12 and 12. It says rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. If your prayer life has not been activated, you need to activate your prayer life because we are dealing with persecution. We're dealing with affliction. We're dealing with stress. We feel the pressure all around. But if we just learn how to pray, can I get an amen? If you're on Facebook, go ahead and say amen. Go ahead and pray. We need to pray. We need to pray until something happens. We need to pray regardless of what we're contending with because God is still a sovereign God. God is still a merciful God. He is still on the throne. Let's jump to 1 Peter 5 and 9. It says, whom resist steadfast in faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. That should encourage you to let you know that you are not alone. We are not alone. There are so many people that are contending with the exact same thing, but someone has to pray. Someone has to intercede. Someone has to believe because the Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that's unseen. We don't know when the situation is going to train, change, but we have to know that the situation, it shall and it will change. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3 and 12. It says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ, Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
I think, well, I know for a fact, oftentimes we do new converts a disservice because in their minds, they believe, oh, I've given my life to Christ. I've surrendered my all to Christ. And now it means that I am perfectly fine and nothing's going to happen. So when you were a part of the adversaries team, he had you. But when you change over to the true and living God, he wants you back. So he's going to try everything to convince you to come back to him. He's going to allow situations that you're going to find yourself in situations and precarious situations, but let it be known unto you that Jesus Christ, we're on the winning team and we win. So what are we going to do in response to tribulation? in response to affliction, in response to persecution, in response to pressure, in response to confinement, where it feels like we don't have any options. So I want to give you an Old Testament example of an individual that found himself in a situation, in a warlike situation. So in Judges um, chapter 6, if we read the Judges chapter six, it's talking about that in the days of Gideon, specifically Gideon and the Israelites, they were living in a constant state of fear. There was trepidation. You know, they were fearful. There were so many things going on and they found themselves that they were about to have a battle with the Midianites. Um, the Midianites by, I'm gonna tell you some background, Median was Abraham's son. And the word median means strife, anger, or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues, basically a conflict. Are we dealing with conflict? Um, so the Medianites, they had been defeated previously, but for some reason they reemerged. And they, they were overwhelming. They would come in like in some type of mob force and they were just trying to overwhelm and they were trying to depress. They were trying to constrict. They were trying to confine the Israelites. So what type of conflict are we dealing with? I talked about earlier, we're dealing with coronavirus. We're dealing with socioeconomic stuff. We're dealing with uh, unrest, racial tension. We're dealing with life in general. Um, there are certain things that we felt that we had defeated. You know, prior to uh, coronavirus, you know, I, I remember telling my husband, I said, you know, Robert, um, dealing with this, when they, when they shut everything down, I felt like I was back in Afghanistan. People were like, what does that mean? I said, when, when you're in a war, like war zone, you're confined to a certain area. You have no idea where the, the insurgents are lurking and your hopes are that the people that are uh, protecting the perimeter, that they are alert and they know what's going on. It's like with coronavirus, we were restricted. We had no idea who was carrying the virus. We had no idea what, uh, what the scientists or whomever were trying to come up with some type of vaccination. And we don't know what would happen if we contracted coronavirus. We had no clue and I just felt restricted. I felt confined and I did not like it at all. And sometimes it would trigger certain, um, certain memories of Afghanistan. But what did I do? I had to pray. I had to see God's face. I was like, God, I thought that was, that was gone. But that, that situation had reemerged. I'm just being transparent and open. You know, we say honest, open, and transparent. We're hot at Victory Worship Center. But the thing is, even though it felt overwhelming, even though it felt like it was all consuming, as with Gideon, as with the Israelites, they cried out to God. So the thing is, when we find ourselves in tribulation, we have to learn how to cry out to God. And getting back to the text in Judges 6, they cried out to God and God responded. You know, oftentimes um, they were crying out because they're like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. Oh my goodness, this is happening. And many nights are trying to come against this. They're bringing about all this conflict. But God sent a prophet and the prophet gave a word. And Gideon was the one that was selected to aid in the uh, deliverance from the situation that they were in. So Gideon received specific instructions. Gideon received a visitation from the angel. So what I'm telling you, when you cry to God, God will send 
a word. God will, because angel is angelos, messenger. God will send a messenger. He will send a message to you if you truly cry to God and say, God, I'm in this situation. You know I'm in this situation when I'm crying out to you and I need your assistance. So God sent an angel to visit Gideon. He provided Gideon specific instructions. And then as a result of those instructions, like in Genesis 6 and 24 it says, then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Until this day, it is yet in Oprah and the Abizite, the rice. So the thing is, the Israelites cried out. They were in a conflict. They were in a situation. They felt confined. They felt they were without options. But, you know, the angel of the Lord came to get in. I mean, that was something that hadn't happened before. And, you know, if you read the scripture, it talks about, you know, Gideon did this, he put a police for God and all these different things. He was called a man of valor. And Gideon was like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is, I'm paraphrasing. This is not exactly what it says. They don't say, she said, I'm paraphrasing. All right. It was like, Gideon was like, how are you calling me a man of valor? What does that really mean? But the thing is, even though they were without options, they felt as if they were without options, Jesus is an option. God is the best option we can have. And when we find ourselves in tribulation, rest assured if we cry out to God, we receive the instructions from God, we receive a message from God, he will give us shalom because he is the God of peace. He's a God of peace. So what is it? We're talking about peace because the scripture, we go back, <clears throat> excuse me, to John 16 and 33 it says that these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world so peace G 1515 15, Aaron it means undisturbed it means wholeness um, an example when all essential parts are joined together peace God's gift of wholeness why is it that we can have peace in the things of God, knowing that previously the tribulations are still there? We're still feeling that we're without options. We feel that there's confinement. We still that there's restriction. When we have God and we speak to God, we cry to God, He will give us a type of peace. Why? If you go to Colossians 1 and 20, it says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. So the reason why Jesus came, he came to reestablish a relationship between God and man. Because you know the story, you go back to Genesis where Adam sinned in a garden. You know, he found himself naked and he was like, he tried to blame the woman and the woman tried to blame the serpent. And as a result of them disobeying God, there was a separate them. They separated themselves from God because of sin. But Jesus Christ, he died on the cross. He came back to restore that relationship. And he restored that relationship by making the ultimate sacrifice of giving himself to the cross. But as we all realize that he rose again. So let's talk. We're still talking about peace on tonight. Second Thessalonians 3 and 16 it says, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Now the Lord himself, he's trying to give us peace because we talked about Jehovah Salom. He is the God of peace. He is peace. By all means, in every area of our life, God wants us to have peace. He wants to be, if we have Jesus, if we have the Holy Spirit reside on the inside of us, we should have a certain level of peace. We shouldn't be disturbed. We should feel whole if we have God on the inside of us because he provides us with that wholeness. He provides us with that peace. If you go to St. John 14 and 27, it says, St. John 14 and 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the fact of 
the matter is that we realize that our heart is so. In Proverbs 4 and 23, it says everything flows from it. You know, everything flows from our heart. And Jesus, there is peace that has been left unto us. It's not like the peace that we get from the world. You know, the world's peace is temporary. But the peace that we give from God himself is everlasting. Even when all Hades is breaking loose in the environment that you're in, whether it's your home, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's on I-10, 410, 35, Pray for me. You see my facial expression change. I'd be like, God, I need your peace right now. And people are like, I think Overseer was talking about it. I was kind of laughing on Sunday. He was talking about we are going 80 miles per hour, which is exceeding the speed limit. And the person in front of you is going 20 miles per hour in the passing lane. You're like, God, I need your peace right now. I need your peace right now, God. We're not saying get a piece of steel. We're talking about you need the peace of God to overshadow you. The thing is, so we don't want our hearts to have any anxiety or distress. If we truly tap into the peace that God is trying to provide us, we will be whole. In Philippians 4 and 7, and it says, a peace of God that passes, exceeds, greater than our, our comprehensions, our understanding, shall keep our hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. I mean, like I said, it's unexplainable peace. Um, I recall there are situations that happen when I used to be in the workforce and when I was on active duty. It's like everything was just going haywire. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. But it's like I had a certain level of peace and they're looking at me like, you're not, I, I was like, I shouldn't respond this way if I truly had the Holy Spirit residing on inside of me. You know, because the Holy Spirit, he's a paraclete, he's a comforter, he's going to be with me at all times. Because the thing is, our responding in an ungodly manner does not truly, it's not representative of God anyway. But we say we have peace. Our lifestyle should show peace. So when everything is going on, peace should come. It's like uh, internally, the flesh wants to act out, the flesh wants to respond contrary, but when we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, even though they're true relation, God will give us his peace. And one place, in fact, that we want peace is in our minds. So Isaiah 26, three through, through four, it says, Isaiah 26, three through four, it says, thou will keep him in perfect peace, complete peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Now, oftentimes, we have to, I mean, we truly have to ask God to help our minds. Because the thing is, we are have disruptions, distractions, disturbances in our minds. You know, everything could actually be pretty decent, but because our minds are skewing things are being skewed you know things are we're allowing the adversary to put thoughts in our minds and then that thought is becoming reality to us and it's not even true my undergrads in psychology and they talk about we spend 10 percent of our time worrying about 90 percent of the time worrying about things that aren't going to happen it's like 90 percent of the time we're worrying about things that aren't going to happen. And the other 10%, you're like, those things might happen, but 90% of the times we'll worry about stuff that never, ever happens. So case in point, it was like, um, for those who have children and your children have yet to start driving, it's like, as a parent, well, well, as a parent, as a mother, specifically as a mother, I'm going to speak to myself. It's like when Emmanuel first started driving, I was cool. You know, he would drive, you know, five minutes up the road to his high school. But now he's driving 45 minutes to an hour on campus to Texas A&M San Antonio. And then I was like, oh, my goodness, God, that's my baby. I don't want anything to happen to him. That's my baby, God. You know, because he's my child. You know, I carried him for nine months. That's my child. And I'm concerned about him. You know, I'm concerned about Robert. I'm concerned about my mom. But the thing is, when you have child, you're, you're, you're concerned about him. 
And then, so a couple of weeks ago, a man had an accident. And if a perfect accident could occur, it was a perfect accident because he wasn't injured. The person that was in the accident was, was not injured. The vehicles had like cosmetic things going on with him. And God was like, and I was like, God, he had an accident. He was like, uh, yeah, Yolanda. But he walked away from the accident. The other person walked away from the accident. There was minimal damage to the vehicle. And I was like, okay, I, God, I got you. And then that same week, he's driving a car while his truck is in the shop. He called and I'm like, okay, Emmanuel doesn't call. Emmanuel only texts and say, I'm on my way home. And then all of a sudden he was like, mama, yeah, I was driving and I don't think we have a tire anymore on the car. And I was like, God, those tires are only three months old. What is going on? And he was like, Emmanuel was able to call you. You should still have peace. And it's like every situation that occurred, God was like, you should still have peace. You know, I, and then he said, then he reminded me, he said, I showed you a vision of the future. And he was like, how can that future thing take place if he's not here? And I was like, God, I repent. God, you, you, you sent, you know, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit to be my comforter. I shall allow the Holy Spirit to comfort me. I shall allow the Holy Spirit to give me peace. So from that point on, when the adversary tries to say, because the adversary told me, I'm going to kill your son. I was like, say, not bind you right now in the name of Jesus. You have no authority. God loves Emmanuel more than I could ever love him. So you have no authority. I shut every door. I shut every attack of the adversary. So when the enemy tries to attack you in your mind, you need to go ahead and shut that door and tell the enemy he needs to get thee behind, like the Jesus said, when he was tempted in the garden, he was hungry. He said, get thee behind me because it is written. We need to give the adversary the word. Don't play with the devil. Just give him the word. So Psalms 19 and 14, proceeding on, we're talking about the mind and we're talking about strength. Psalms 19 and 14, it says, because we want to make sure what we say is right. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So we're talking about, once again, we're talking about our minds. If we realize that our minds are a perfect peace, we understand that God is our strength. He's our rock. Jehovah Tassir means rock. He is our rock. And not only is he our rock, he's our redeemer, Jehovah God. He buys everything back. And that just is a segue to our third point, talking about if he's our redeemer, we are victorious. So Victory. It is Greek word 3528, Nikeo. It means I conquer, I am victorious, I've overcome, I prevailed, I've subdued, I have conquered, and to carry off the victory and come off victorious. And of course, when we think about a victory, there's implications of some sort of battle. So Romans 8 and 37. Because we're talking about the battles that we deal with, the situation that we contend with. It says in Romans 8 and 37, it says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What things are they talking about? And all what things? If you go back to the scriptures earlier, 36, 35, 36, 36, 36 it talks about tribulation, distress, persecution, asking what's going to separate us famine, nakedness, peril, sword, and it talks about we're killed all the day long, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. I mean, you know, I talked to Robert, we have a conversation about his workplace. He talks about many, some of the injustices, some of the things that are going on in his workplace, and it felt, it feels like, because we're like sheep, they're, sheep are considered not very bright animals, but the thing is, you, we, why, why just, we need to pray. I mean, it's like we're going around dealing with all these different things, but we have to recognize that we are still victorious. We are overcome, overcomers. We will conquer. We will subdue and we will prevail. How do I know that? Because in 1 John 4 and 4, it says, ye, we are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in us, in you, than the he that is in the world. Now, if we realize that he is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger, we have to recognize that we are victorious. We have the victory. We have the victory. But you have to believe that you have the victory. So in 1 John 5 and 4, 1 John 5 and 4, it says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, 
even our faith. And those who believe in Jesus are the ones that overcome. Do you believe in Jesus? If you believe in Jesus, go ahead and put it in your chat. Go ahead and put it in the Facebook comment. Say, I believe in Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, you have to recognize that we have the victory. You should go ahead and just give God the glory and give God the praise because we are more than conquerors. We are children of the most high God. I got excited a little bit right there. So, and if we go to, I'm going to give you an example of someone that was in battle. And I, I immediately thought about King Jehoshaphat. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I mean, you can read the entire text. But once again, I said, when we think about a battle, we think about victory and then victorious and being overcomers, there are implications and it implies that we've had some sort of battle. So in 2 Chronicles 20, 15 and 27, I'm gonna give a little small recap. So King Jehoshaphat, he was encircled by all these different people, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some other people. And they cried out to God. And he was like, okay, all right, God, we have a situation. We have a situation. Um, and he was talking about Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. And they were like, we have been encircled. Uh, we realized that we're about to go to war and God, we, we need you. So what Jehoshaphat did, he said, okay, he felt, he, I mean, it talks about it. He felt fearful, but it says, and even while he was feeling fearful, he sought God. And not only did he seek the face of God and, and inquire of the Lord, he fasted at everybody fasting. You know, people don't want to push their plates back, but I encourage you, you know, some things don't come out. They only come out through fasting and praying. So the plates are pushed back, they didn't eat, they didn't do whatever, they inquired of the Lord and God gave him instruction that you need to send Judah first. Send Judah first. So when you find yourself in a situation, they sent Judah first, they sang songs, and they praised God. And while they were singing songs and praising God, an ambushment took place. And the people that were coming up against them killed. They were killed. They were gone. They were dead. And they didn't have to pick up a sword. They didn't have to pick up anything. But they sent praise and they sang song to God. They followed God's specific instructions. So how are we victorious? We are victorious in our praise. We need to praise God for his mercy endured forever. I want you all to just think about all the times that you find yourself in a little skirmish. But if we would just give God the praise, if we would just give God the glory, he would show up and he would make us more than conquerors because we are overcomers through Jesus Christ. Like, you need to go ahead and send your victory and your praise up unto the God of, uh, of our salvation because he's worthy of all our glory. He's worthy of all our honor and he's worthy of all our praise. Like, so when you find yourself in a precarious situation, go ahead and send you the first. And in 2 Chronicles 20 and 27, it says, then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. They were victorious because they sent up praise first. We need to learn how to send up Judah first. You know, we talked about earlier about praying. We talked about fasting, but it's all right to give God the praise. When you find yourself in that situation, it's okay to raise your hands. It's okay to shout unto God. It's okay to sing a new song until our true and living God, because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. And our fourth and final point, we're talking about cheer, because once again, and John 16 and 33, it says, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you shall have peace in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. So what, regardless of what you are going through in the world, it's already been conquered. So how do we know? Because the word of God says we have already overcome and we've already conquered through Jesus Christ. So, okay, what does cheer mean? According to the Greek 
22, 23, is Tharsel. It says, I am of good courage, good cheer, and bold, bolster within which support unflinching courage. You know, that confidence should just radiate and exude from us because of the God that we serve. God is trying to bolster the believer. He's trying to empower us to let us know that on the inside of us, the whole that sure has been infused with us. He's given us the strength. And it's all because we have the faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So when we talk about the cheer, I said, be of good cheer. Because why? He's already overcome the world. How is that con conquered? The world has already been conquered. Um, conquered, overcome, and taken control over by force. The word of God talks about the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and a violent take it by force. Some things have to be just snatched up. Some things have to be forced, but you better make sure that you have the whole armor of God when you're trying to take something by force. That, that was free. Go ahead and write that down. You can, yeah, hallelujah. Anyway, so for number two, the second point is it is conquered for us. For us. Who? You? Yes, you. Sue, so, directly addressing a person. God is letting us know that he did it for us. He sent his son for us, not for just for us. Say, yeah, me, mm -hmm. go ahead and point to yourself, for you. And then it says, who did the conquering? Christ, Jesus Christ, Christo. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He did it for us. And you know, I was looking for an example in the Bible of someone that found themselves in a precarious situation. And I, I, I went to Acts 23 and Acts 27, and I, I was thinking about um, Paul in Acts 23 and 11, it says, and the night following the Lord, Acts 23 and 11, and the night following the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must I bear witness also at Rome. Some plots were being uncovered. If you see God's face, and if you know that he, we've already overcome through Jesus Christ, he's going to uncover some things in life. And then Acts 27 and 22, Acts 27 and 22, it says, now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. So Paul has been shipped off somewhere to prison. And, but the Holy Spirit revealed unto him that something was gonna happen. He revealed, the Holy Spirit revealed that there a shipwreck would occur. But even though we find ourselves shipwrecked, even though we might find ourselves shipwrecked, even though we might find ourselves alone on an island, the Holy Spirit will empower us. The Holy Spirit will let us see things that others cannot see. So I'm encouraging you on today, it be of good cheer because your spiritual eyes can be open. Your ears can be open to hear specifically what God is revealing to us. We just have to spend some time with him. We cannot allow distractions to come. You know, I was teaching on last third, a couple of Thursdays ago, teaching SWAP. And I was saying how oftentimes, you know, I get up in the morning, well, every morning I get up and I have devotion with God. And I'm trying to, you know, give my time, my, my undivided attention. And all of a sudden, while I'm on my knees praying, I started thinking about, oh, what do I need to do today? And I was like, I was like repenting. I was like, God, I repent because this time is supposed to be set aside for you. And I was like, so I started praying. I was like, God, I, I repent. God, give me the grace to really go in and seek your face and not allow distractors to keep me from hearing from you because that's what the adversary wants to do. He wants to distract us. He doesn't want us to hear what God is trying to speak to us. So in a situation with Paul, he was open and God revealed to him, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that yeah, there's gonna be a shipwreck, but no lives would be lost. And then in Acts 27 and 25, it says, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told to me. When God speaks, we need to listen. And he will show forth himself strong. So on today, we talked about peace. We talked about tribulation. And we talked about cheer. We talked about overcoming. So even though we might experience tribulation, remember he is our peace and we 
have the victory. We have the victory. We are victorious. We can be cheerful knowing that we serve a God. We can be cheerful knowing that we can send Judah first. We can be cheerful even though we find ourselves, we feel as if we're restricted, we feel as if we're confined, but God will bring us out. We just have to be in tune to what he is speaking to us. Be in tune to what he is speaking to us and do not allow distractors or distractions to keep you from hearing what God is speaking. So I pray on tonight that you receive um, some manna, some rainbow word on today. And I was just excited about the lesson. So right now I'm gonna turn it back over to our overseer and pastor and God bless you, amen. Greetings everyone. Uh, we thank God for just, just time.